You know why I think people drink black coffee? It's because they're old. So, like, you know, the older you get, like, the worse your taste buds get. And so, like, when you're old, like, you can't, like, tell how terrible it tastes. Like the last guy that I just had on the podcast. Ex- exactly. So, it, it's Luke, really... you're not that old. Oh, you're so, I'm so bad because I drink black coffee. It's like, look, dude, you're just old and you've lost most of your taste buds. So, like, you know, cool it. Welcome to the Chatterfast Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about the Enneagram. And today, I have Josiah with me. So, welcome, Josiah. Thanks, man. Yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, and so we've known each other for a long time, dude. Yeah, it's hard to think back. <laughs> we, met, we met back in college, so that would have been, I guess we, we would have met in 08. Yeah, uh, somewhere around then. I don't know what year you were in 08. I started like in six, so I was on my third year. Yeah, so so I came to college in 08 and kind of bumped. I, I, I guess I met you guys first semester. Yeah, yeah, you, you were in our, the way that college works is like friend circles. Yeah, and Click. We were very clickish. No one else was allowed. We weren't, we weren't, we weren't, we weren't, we weren't. If any of those people listen right now, they'd be like, what? They're calling us a click? And I was like, well, on, on topic. I don't know, dude. Slightly cult. No, just kidding. Oh, it was a cult. <laughs> it was not a cult. Uh. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't know. It's hard to imagine. You know, you have people you hang out with. So I guess what makes it a click is when you're exclusive. So we weren't, we weren't like exclusionary. We like, we like well, included people. Do you remember there was a particular incident with some of the people and like, we don't want them to be hanging out with us anymore. That happened. I don't remember that. Okay. Maybe that was prior to you, but I did have another group and there was a girl and her nick. I guess I could just say her nickname because like, it's not like her and her name. Nobody will know who it is. I, I called her, we called her excommunicated Kate. And <laughs> the, terrible. Because I, I was being friendly to different people, inviting them to hang out with my friends, and the group that I was hanging out with, not the group that we hung right, out with, right, right. decided that I was the liaison, and thus I needed to be the one to dismiss this person from the group. They were no longer interested so, in having... So wait, did that make you the pope of the group, or were you like you were just like the, the ex- executioner? Whoever does the pope's dirty work, that, oh, that person. Okay, okay, I think okay. that's what I was so supposed the, to the, do. The, the secret service for Rome, Rome's secret service. Yeah, and that was just like, you know, an awkward conversation, because it's like, well, we're not really cliquish, but we're casting you out of the group. <laughs> and, and the person's just sitting there, which I get why they threw, threw her out of the group, because then the whole time she's just like defending herself and saying how she was a great person and all these other people say she's a great person. I was like, well, if you're going down that route, it's... Mm. But my grandmother loves me so much. Uh, you yeah, should yeah. hear what my grandmother says about me. You know, I think probably the reason for that is different people's personalities. You know? Oh, yeah. That's 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 the reason that that came about. You know, it's just she just had a personality that didn't click. And so, you know, people say that the Enneagram will teach you all about how to fix that. Yeah. Um. I And then in some points, so if you don't know what the Enneagram is, maybe we'll have somebody else on here to talk about it. But the gist of it is... is to me, is a personality test. Yeah, so, you know, it was interesting. I was talking, so, you know, I have a, a very close friend who is very excited about <laughs> the Enneagram, and uh, I was talking to her about it, and she kind of pushed back against the idea of, of the Enneagram being a personality test, but if you do a quick search online, like, that's what everybody says. It's it's basically a personality test. And, and But something really important to me is, and hopefully I've done a good job about this um, in, the, in the material I'm going to present, but I want to present things that are like, well researched and properly representing the other side. I don't. I don't want to caricature them. So I, I grabbed the definition um, of the enneagram, and I don't remember. It was from a website, and I have. I have all the links to my sources. So if people ask for like sources for this stuff, I have it all. Uh, maybe I'll put. Um, maybe you just send them to me. I'll it's put the show of, notes in the description. Kind of a like, lot of them. Yeah, but that's okay. You know, you, YouTube descriptions can be really long. <laughs> the quote that I found was from one point of view, the enneagram can can be seen as a set of nine distinct personality types, each one uh, with each number on the Enneagram denoting one type. It's common to find a little of yourself in all nine types, although one of them should stand out as being closest to yourself. This is your basic personality type. So again, you know, as far as what the Enneagram is, yeah, it's a set of nine personality types. And, you know, there are a lot of personality types out there. And, and even in some other episodes of podcasts I listened to prepping for this, you know, they talk about, you know, like the four humors from the Greeks and stuff. So there's there's a lot of those things. But instead of having like, you know, names like phlegmatic or choleric or whatever, it's just a number. So like, oh, like I'm a two, you know, I'm a I'm a eight, I'm a six, whatever. So. Yeah, and each of those each of those numbers corresponds to a personality type, and like an anti personality type too, right? Like there's like a good and bad version of it from what I understood. Yeah, we we can talk about that a little bit. You know, you have you have the you have your base type, and that's sort of like the very 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 high level enneagram stuff. And we'll talk about this a little later, but I think it's probably the least dangerous. Like, oh oh, I'm a, I'm a five. Oh, I'm a two. Like, that's that's not I'm not concerned about that. You know, personally, I guess 
we didn't really talk about, you know, why we're talking about the Enneagram. So I, at the end of the day, you know, we'll go through this and I have some concerns about, about using the Enneagram itself. Um, and, and that'll become pretty apparent as we talk about what the Enneagram is. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of why I wanted to talk about it in general. Um, but so on top of having your main personality type, so your, your number, um, you also have what are called wings. And again, I'm not super familiar with all of it. Um, I've, I've done some, I've done the test and I'm, I'm supposed to be a, an eight, I think. Um, hmm. but anyway, so you have wings. Um, so like obviously on either side of eight is seven and nine. So you're going to, uh, you'll either be an eight with a seven wing or an eight with a nine wing, or maybe you're like, don't have a wing, but so that kind of influences your personality. And then there's, um, there are also subtypes. So like I'm this kind of an eight and that has like, it, it gets really complicated. It's, it can be very, very complex. It sounds like there's more than nine types. What you were talking about is like an anti-type. What your type acts like when it's healthy mm-hmm. and what it acts like when it's not healthy. So, you know, maybe you should put up on the screen an image of what the Enneagram... There's, there's an Enneagram diagram. Here's a picture of the Enneagram. Ba-da! <laughs> Ba-boom. With the magic of technology, we've <laughs> added a picture of the Enneagram. Uh, anyway, whatever. So, if you look at the Enneagram, you'll see there's a point... Uh, there are nine points kind of around a circle. And then that point is connected to two other points. And those two other points um, will be kind of where your type slides if it's healthy or unhealthy. So, you know, I, and I, unfortunately, if I was smart, I would have an Enneagram in front of me, but it's only in magical digital world. But, you know, you, you, you slide, you know, if you're an eight, you might slide toward this type when you're not, when you're not healthy and you slide toward this type when you are healthy. So like, if you're healthy, you'll slide to a type that counteracts some of the negative attributes of your type. And if you're unhealthy... Maybe this is also another distinction because I think people are familiar with this. Like everybody's like told that stubbornness is a bad thing. But then the right. same trait is also perceived as persistence. Definitely. So there's positives and negatives to everything. So you'll slide to the positive side of what you're doing. So persistence is a good example. Maybe if you were on a negative side of a persistent type Enneagram, you know, um, you would just, you know, insist on everything and never let anything go. And if you're on the positive side, like you would know, like you stick hard to the important things and then, you know, relax on less important things. And that's not a specific Enneagram example, but that's kind of the, kind of the idea. Um, and so then the question that arises is, you know, where does your type come from, right? Um, so there are a couple of different things. Um, some sources might say that, you know, your type is an inborn temperament or like from prenatal factors. So like, you know, it's in your genes. It's, you know, it's defines who I am, uh, to, quote, to quote a, a I famous. I was born this way. Sure, sure. People like Ian Cron and Beatrice Chestnut uh, would say things like um, it has to do with the way you grew up. So things you experienced in your child, sometimes they might talk about childhood trauma, you know, causing specific elements of this. So like um, they might say like a two might have received a message in childhood that they weren't loved for who they are, but for being likable, supportive of others, um, doing things for others. And that was in in the episode um, between Ian Gron and Beatrice Chestnut that I mentioned to you. Yeah. So that's kind of where the types come from. You know, they're, they're either, either they're inborn or maybe it has to do some with some with your upbringing, but it's probably some combination of those two or one of those two things. Um, so then, okay. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what the Enneagram is, you know, where your type comes from. And then, you know, there are a lot of reasons why you might want to know your type. Right. So, um, so at, at work, you know, we do a personality test for all employees at work, and we use. What's I believe called, a lot of jobs yeah. do something similar. It's to very that. popular, frankly. In my day in day out work, I don't ever use it, like, or very rarely. Like, I don't look at somebody's type and say, "Oh yeah, you know, they're this type, so that means I should, I should do this." There's this like distinction of two types of people in the world, and like, people who like, really adhere to personality types are trying to figure those things out, and then people are just like, "I don't care." I mean, it is valuable, and so I mean, even even thinking back on some bad work experiences I had, I'm like, "Oh, you know that that may be, you know, because so we use DISC at work, uh, and that may be well, this person that I had a really hard time with had a really high dominance, um, you know, factor, but they were also reporting to me, blah blah blah." So, it, bottom line is, in a business environment, uh, you might want to know about your type, uh, you know, to, in order to have better interactions, under, understand people's strengths and weaknesses. And so the Enneagram could be used for the same thing. You know, this is, this is the way this person operates. Um, you know, kind of going beyond that, you, know, you can also use personality types in counseling. So, you know, you have this issue, this thing you struggle with. So you have, you know, you have this issue you're working through and your counselor is trying to help you with it. And this is, this is, this is the thing they're doing to like, 
try to help you out. Yeah. Um, so so that could be you could use it for that. And then the you know, so the Enneagram or um, you know, the the Myers Briggs, you know, mm-hmm. might be common. I think we took something similar to the Myers Briggs for marriage counseling, you know, to mm-hmm. kind of help us understand, you know, how we were gonna interact together, whatever. And then the Enneagram has some other elements too. Some people, you know, use the Enneagram specifically, you know, to focus on spiritual development. So like it's a spiritual development tool to like mm-hmm. help improve your relationship with God, help help you better understand your your personal sins, that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. and that's kind of that's kind of like a post counseling thing. It's beyond just like, hey, you know, I have these psychological issues. It's like, look, this is this is like specifically spiritual. And I don't know, you know, counseling itself um, in very conservative Christian circles is a is a bit of a taboo topic. And and you know, I think for some good reason, you know, you know, Carl Jung uh, and and uh, you know Nietzsche, Freud. Freud, that's what I'm thinking of. Freud, Freud, you know, those dudes had some very specific and kind of weird spiritual perspectives. So I mean, for a conservative Christian, it makes sense that that would be concerning. Um, and this, I think that that element of the Enneagram as as spiritual development um, plays it ha, has a similar tone mm-hmm. that makes me nervous. So anyway, not going to get into that right now. Um, so that's that's kind of what the Enneagram mm-hmm. is, what it's about, where it came from. Obviously, we have some people. I think you're going to get a little more into the origins or like some of the people regarding the creation. Yeah, and- that's another great question. Is you know where did the Enneagram come from? And this, I think, when we get into where the Enneagram came comes from, that's when a lot of the key controversial pieces start to come to the front and things that. So you know, I'm a I'm a I would consider myself a pretty conservative Christian. Um, uh, you know, you might call me a classical fundamentalist. I think there are some some problems with some veins of fundamentalism, but I, I would consider myself a classical fundamentalist. Um, that is, I I adhere to the fundamentals of the faith. Um. So, you know, there are some issues with the origins of the Enneagram that a conservative Christian um, and certainly a, a, you know, a classical, classically fundamental Christian mm. might have some concerns with. So um, proponents of the Enneagram often talk about, you know, lots of different things about the origins of the Enneagram. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, it comes down to us from the obscure and cloudy past. You know, it's, it's mystical. It's ancient. Um but the, the documentation for that is not very good. Mm. Uh, a lot of times they'll claim that it came from Pythagoras. Um, makes sense. Hey, it's a nine-sided shape, and Pythagoras was all about shapes and sides, bro. So, you know, totally, it's from him. <laughs> you know, eh, whatever. And I, I haven't now, to be to be fair, I haven't specifically researched a lot of these claims. Um, but my understanding from the sources that I'm reading is that those, those are not true or they're not strong. So anyway, you have some people say it came from Pythagoras. Some people even suggest, so he was a Greek philosopher. Some people also suggest it came from the Desert Fathers, which were a group of, um, you know, early church um, mystical teachers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of that has gained a lot of popularity through the years. You know, I think there's a lot of benefit from the early church fathers and reading them and understanding them. But um, the bottom line is I don't think there's any good support to show that the Enneagram actually comes from the early church mm-hmm. fathers. Um now, when you're looking at people, so before I move on to where I think the Enneagram actually came from, if you're looking into those kind of claims, when somebody claims, you know, Pythagoras developed the Enneagram or the early church fathers developed the Enneagram, you've got to understand that drawing a shape with nine points is not sufficient to prove that this person invented the Enneagram. <laughs> because, like, anybody can draw a shape with nine points. So you really, you know, you'd have to, be able to trace, you know, a line to say Pythagoras, you know, taught this thing and this specifically corresponds to the teachings of the Enneagram, not just the drawing, not just a nine-sided shape or a nine-pointed shape, but this specifically corresponds to like, you know, I don't even know what it would correspond to because, because frankly, um, there's no good evidence that, that any of the ancients claimed ancient sources of the Enneagram or even older sources of the Enneagram use the personality types yeah. and we'll get into where the personality types themselves came from. Um, but you know you have you have to connect it somehow to say well the number two this point on the enneagram you know he was talking about and a two is like you know an outgoing person or a a, a helping person or whatever the befriender hmm. so you know the the two you know you'd have to associate that with, with what Pythagoras thought and then you'd have to show that like and he taught it to this person and this person is teaching similar things and you have to connect it all the way back hmm. so to prove the ancient origins of the enneagram is not a trivial task so. Um, you know, I would just ch- challenge people if they research into that evidence, um, 
that's the way they need to think. Um, and I think I think a good example of that is a lot of people will claim that Christianity was borrowed from other religions. Mm. And what you have to do when you look at those kind of claims, it's the same sort of thing. You say, okay, well, you know, look, you know, this 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 Osiris was was sewed into this god's thigh, you know, and then and then he was born. Well, look, bro, that's not a virgin birth. Sorry, okay, it doesn't count. <laughs> it's it's not even it's not even that close when you look at the original sources. So. That's what I would just say about investigating the early uh, early history, the supposed ancient history of the Enneagram is like, you know, just be careful and think that way. So, you know, that's the ancient background of the Enneagram. And again, it doesn't seem like there's good support for that. Um, but the more recent history is is much more strongly supported. It does seem to change a lot more in the early 1900s from what I researched. Yes. And then at that point, it took several decades before anybody actually really associated personality yeah, types to all the points. Definitely. So I grabbed a little paragraph from a website called the Integrative Nine or Integrative Nine. Um, and again, we'll give, we'll give the link. But uh, the paragraph goes, the more recent evolution of the Enneagram in the form and shape that it is known in the 21st century is much clearer. Uh, Gurdjieff, which I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but Gurdjieff was a Russian mystic and teacher – um, a Russian mystic and teacher used the Enneagram to explain the unfolding of creation, calling it a symbol of perpetual motion. Obviously, nothing to do with <laughs> nothing to do with personality types yet. Um, but anyway, he used he did use that symbol. He uh, he alludes to the fact that he was introduced to the Enneagram in the nineteen twenties during a visit to a monastery in Afghanistan. But it is not definitively explain the symbol's origin. So again, you know, he's claiming that. Um, and there are some later sources that suggest that that's not even true, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, so going on from there, in South America, Oscar, Oscar, Oscar Echazo, the Bolivian-born founder of the uh, Arica School, established in 1968, all stopped the, taught the Enneagram. And a little bit about the Arica School. School. I mean, this is a this is a center for New Age thought. <laughs> mm-hmm. is, is what the Arica School in Chile was. So. You know, just just take that and keep that in mind. So back to the quote. During the 1960s, as Charles's energy enneagram of personality and related theories formed a larger part of the teaching of a teach of teaching he termed uh, proto analysis. Now, from other sources, I'm not sure that Victor Achazo or I'm sorry, Oscar Achazo even used um, the enneagram as a personality tool. But anyway, we'll we'll move on from there uh, with the quote. Claudio Naranjo. Naranjo, a Chilean uh, psychiatrist, was exposed to the Enneagram through Echazo and brought the Enneagram into into the modern psychological tradition. So apparently, Naranjo is a is a trained psychologist, um, and he's a he is a key piece in the Enneagram. Um, so that that would that that's an example again from the Integrative Nine website uh, or Integrative Nine um, as to what an Enneagram proponent might say about its history. Um, now, one key person who has done a lot of research on the Enneagram, and there's a book called Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret that was co-authored by a lady named Marsha Montenegro. Um, she has a Facebook page and a, and a website called Christian Answers for the New Age. It's it's hard to work through. Frankly, her her formatting and presentation isn't very good, but I feel like a lot of inform- her information is very good. Mm-hmm. But in any case, when she talks about the origins of the Enneagram, um, this is what she would say, kind of as an, in a direct response to what um, the paragraph I just read. So Claudio Naranjo, in a video interview, admits that he and Oscar Chazo lied about the Enneagram having ancient origins when they knew it didn't. They knew Gruchev's claims about it were false. That is that it came from this monastery in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Echazo never came up with the nine personality types. It is known that Naranjo came up with that. At about 345 in, in, an, interv- in an interview, Naranjo states that the nine types came from automatic writing. Mm-hmm. He states that some of it came from his own observations, but it mostly came from automatic writing. And that's definitely a, an important link that I want to include in the, in the um, stuff we have. So this cements the evidence of the Enneagram's cult or, occult origins in nature. Mm-hmm. So... You know, even in the um, Integrative Nine website's information, you know, it makes it sound like Oscar Echazo is the one who's coming up with the Enneagram. In that video, they talk about any or the Enneagram types. They call talk about any types um, in that video, but really, um, and, and it's, I mean, there's a video of Oscar Echazo saying this, so it, it's not really, it's pretty uncontrovertible uh, evidence on that point. But he came up with it with through automatic writing. Now, if you're, you know. If you're not way into the occult and understand automatic writing, you're a normal person. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so automatic writing, uh, you know, it it makes a lot of sense. It's a, it would be a lot like using a Ouija board. So yeah. you know, your hand's supposed to move to the letters, except you're actually writing things. And from what I understand, it if uh, a Christian was to look at it, they would say it's much more like the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to write the scriptures. But it's from being in the occult. It's more from like 
demonic. Fiends and spirits, demonic spirits. Yeah, so so they would call it channeling. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't use the pair. I mean, so in some ways it's, it's not par- the same at all. But. In some in some ways it's parallel to inspiration in that you're getting your thoughts from someone else. Inspiration, you know, naturally we think it would operate even 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 the mechanics of it would operate differently. Yeah. You know, as far as exactly how much information they got and whatever, but bottom line is the person who is who is doing automatic writing thinks he's getting information from some higher spiritual source. Um, and he's writing that down. And naturally, I think any Christian who's hearing that should be concerned. You know, we don't expect Christians to be able to to get information that way. Interestingly enough, there's a book called um, Jesus Calling that is a pretty popular Christian work. And she basically said she was channeling Jesus is the long and short of it. Now, in, in some earlier versions, now she's kind of backed off that claim a little bit. But that's that's the way that book is written is like these are words that Jesus said to her um, directly um, that she wrote out. So. Interestingly, there's there's some connections to even some some recent Christian works that would be, you know, disturbingly similar to automatic writing. But anyway, so that's um, that kind of kind of bumps into the next section pretty cleanly as far as you know concerns about the enneagram. So first off, you know, it's a little disturbing that these people are lying about the origins of the enneagram. So if if I had an enneagram book on my shelf, you know, I would really want to go to the chapter on origins and say, okay, research those claims. You know, okay, so they said, you know. It came from here. It came from the early church fathers. It came from here. Most likely, they're going to be a little vague and say, maybe it came from here. We don't really know. Um, and even that claim, I think, is a little bit uh, deceptive. We do know where it came from. Oscar Achazo wasn't it. Uh, Claudio Naranjo said it on video that you can look at on YouTube today. He told you where the any any types come from. So we do know where it comes from. You know. So so that that just on its face is kind of a kind of a tip off. You know, why are why are people claiming this thing is ancient? Why are people kind of using obfuscative language to mm-hmm. try and say, "Oh, well, you know, maybe it came from here, maybe it came from there." It doesn't doesn't seem true. And then, you know, there's there's the actual cultic origins to deal with. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't know. And and we'll deal with this a little bit how to deal with this information, but it's hard to imagine a really strong case to say I it's think okay that's for like me to the gist of thing why this conversation is happening. I think because like and I don't know this conversation is in my church if that there's any like I don't know proponents church, of it or like literature being passed around it, but I have heard that it is a very um, large part of Christian society right now that are, people are very invested in the Enneagram and having literature on it and trying to understand what types other people are. Having literature on it and trying to understand what types other people are. So so there's been some, you know, as far as the way the Enneagram came into the Catholic Church, and there's a lot of research you could do about this, and I don't have a lot of it in front of me, but, but the long and short of it is there was a Catholic um, who kind of a, a very liberal Catholic who kind of started getting into it. And then he taught a man named Richard Rohr, uh, also a Roman Catholic, um, probably not a very Orthodox Roman Catholic. Um, and he wrote some of the earliest books on it. He, he has, and we'll talk about this a little later too, but he has some very clear um, new age connections with Richard Rohr as well. Um, so that's kind of, and then from there, it's filtered down into evangelicalism. So Ian Cron and Susan, Susan Stabile, Stabile wrote um, The Road Back to You, which is kind of kind of the original, you know, Christian Enneagram book. I, I don't remember. It was either published by Zondervan or InterVarsity Press. I think that one's Zondervan. Um, so big name Christian pu- publisher. And um, yeah, in in kind of broader evangelicalism, what's sometimes times called Big Eva, um, it, it would have a lot of appeal. And we we kind of run in a little bit more conservative circle than that, um, generally speaking. But it does seem to have a pretty broad appeal. There are a lot of Christian Enneagram books coming out. Most people I know would say it's similar to Myers-Briggs or whatever the other personality types. And so they just think, oh, it's just another way to classify people. And this, and this is a little off deal. topic. Let's, I want to talk, I want to come, try to remind me, I want to come yeah. back to that when we kind of talk, yeah. talk at the end. So anyway, um, you know, the cultic origins are concerning. Mm-hmm. And then the Christian promoters of the Enneagram are concerning. So we talked about Richard Rohr. One of the heretical teachings that he has is he talks about the cosmic Christ. Um, and basically says that what was special about Jesus, you know, Jesus wasn't wasn't so much uniquely the Christ as he was connected to the he was a man who was connected to the cosmic Christ, and that's what we that's what he was really teaching us to do. He was teaching us to connect to this to this this cosmic Christ, the, the, whose first incarnation was creation itself, um, and that's really problematic. I mean, and you can do some research on that. There are a couple of episodes in the podcast called Cultish. Uh, about the cosmic Christ and the problems with it, um, but but 
some real issues. You know, he, he talks about, you know, well, sin, sin is something that happened in the Garden of Eden, Eden you know, mm-hmm. uh, and, and that's not a very biblical view of sin. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, almost the majority of promoters of, of the Enneagram are liberals, um, uh, progressive Christians. They're not typically um, people who have strong doctrinal foundations, who strongly believe in uh, the sufficiency of Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture. Um, so that's that's disturbing, you know, in and of itself. Uh, another problem with Richard Rohr is he's what's called a perennialist, and a lot of teachers are going to be are going to be in that camp. And what a perennialist is um, is it's someone who believes that all religions are pointing to the same truth. So you know, and uh, it's not. So that, that's going to promote syncretism, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the Muslims have have some good ideas, and the Hindus and the Buddhists, they're all just kind of pointing to the cosmic Christ. Mm-hmm. And and obviously, you know, the Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You know, we believe that Jesus is the only way to God. Uh, and so that's that's clearly, perennialism is clearly contrary to um, to um, to Orthodox Christian teaching. Now, that's not to say a perennialist wouldn't have responses to that, um, but but the bottom line is I think it's pretty clearly um, heretical. And again, another thing that you'll find is there's some strong New Age influences in on those teachers of the Enneagram, hmm. and that's that's dis- especially dangerous. Oh, so that's not surprising because of his roots, right? Yeah. Oscar Achazo, uh, Claudio Naranjo, those guys are New Agers. Um, you know, they're very interested in new age type spirituality. They're interested in using drugs, uh, in, in, um, in their spirituality. So not surprising that there would be new age influences in a lot of the teachings around the Enneagram. Mm-hmm. Um, but beyond that, um, it, new age influences in the Enneagram are disturbing because of the syncretistic nature of the new age. So syncretism is taking parts of of a religion and syncing it up with your religion. So, mm. okay, yeah, I can be a Christian, but I can also practice voodoo. Mm. You know, or I can be a Christian, but I can also worship Zeus or whatever it is, you know. And and Hindus are also also, you know, um, well known for this. It's just if you have a new god, they just kind of throw him in the pantheon with everybody else. I think there's a religion that's called Bahaism that is not directly like synchronistic, but it more or less says that all religions are connected right. and all the same and it's all equal yeah. except for Mormonism. I think they object to Mormons, <laughs> okay being the Mormons. in there. <laughs> Man, poor Mormons. You got to kick them out too. Uh, anyway. Um, so the, the tricky part about syncretism is um, what often happens is you're going to use Christian terms. You're going to talk about Christ. You know, you're going to talk about redemption. You're even going to talk about sins. You know, Richard Rohr talked about the seven deadly sins as part of his Enneagram teaching. But we're not, they're not defining those terms in the ways we talk about them. And that's important in any kind of apologetic situation when you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or, or, a, or a Muslim. You know, we're not going to be on the same page. A great illustration is, you know, we think about, well, the, uh, Islam's uh, you know, religious book is the Quran. So the Quran's like their Bible, right? But actually... Muslims view the Quran very differently than Christians view the Bible. Mm. The Quran is not something that Muhammad wrote. Mm. Muhammad, there is no, according to the Islam, Islamic orthodoxy, there is no Muhammad in the Quran. Mm. The Quran was given came, was given to Gabriel, uh, or the angel Jabril, as they would say it, on uh, Laylat al-Qadr, the night of power, um, which is, I think it's during Ramadan. And and all of it was given to the angel Gabriel, and then Gabriel gave it to Muhammad piecemeal over the course of thirty years. But it's 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 exact. It's exactly as Allah wrote it. You know, Muhammad didn't write down any of his ideas or thoughts. It's direct dictation from um, from God. And so when you're interacting with a Muslim about the scriptures, you know he's very confused when you have Paul saying, um, "Not I, but the Lord say." He's like. Well, see, Paul's saying it's his own opinion, which if you do careful exegesis, you see that's not what he's saying. Mm-hmm. But um, they're very confused about inspiration. So we both believe in inspiration, but we believe in different things. Mm-hmm. And that's you know that's really hard to parse out. I, I just talked for five minutes about it, which maybe you should cut out of this podcast because it was too long. But the point is, um, it's really hard to parse out these new age ideas and separate, you know, when he says Christ, is he talking about the God-man Jesus? Or is he talking about some 
cosmic force that we all need to connect to mm-hmm. in some weird, uh, you know, esoteric way. Like the Star Wars or something. Yeah, yeah, it's the force. Reach out with your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, so, you know, that makes the Enneagram really dangerous because you can have somebody who's writing about the Enneagram from a supposedly Christian perspective and you get a lot of new age ideas whipped in there and and you just don't, unless you've, you've got your ears really tuned and you're, you're paying very careful attention, you just miss them. I listened to um, The Road Back to You by Ian Cron. I've, I've heard the whole thing and there were some things that were a little disturbing, but it's not overt. You know, it's not, you know, on its face heretical. So that's, that's, you know, a real concern. So we talked about the cultic origins. That's a big concern for the Enneagram. We talked about, you know, the pro- problems with the Christian promoters, you know, involvement in uh, the new age, perennialism, so on and so forth. Um, you know, there's also the problem of lack of scientific support. So mm-hmm. it is interesting. There are, there are clearly trained psychologists and psychiatrists who, who use the Enneagram. Mm-hmm. So I'm not denying that. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's min- minimally as disputed as being a legitimate, um, a legitimate personality test. So Jay Mendewalt uh, wrote a paper uh, that was published in a, in a psychological journal called The Enneagram Science and Christianity, and he wrote, uh, any science, scientist who studies personality would simply look at the reliability scores and conclude the test is not accurate enough to be helpful, and therefore, for they wouldn't use it because the potential for harm would, will be too high. Now, that's that's a really strong statement. Yeah. Um, again, you know, people like Beatrice Chestnut, I mean, she has a degree in psychi- psychology, I believe. So mm. clearly that's not you know, the only view out there, but, but I do believe it is a consensus view. Um, you know, and again, I'm going to make the disclaimer right now. That doesn't mean you can't be helped by the Enneagram. Um, and I think when we talk about how to deal with the Enneagram again, you know, I'll talk about that, but that, that definitely does not mean that you just, you cannot be helped by the Enneagram. It just means that, you know, even though you were helped, that doesn't mean it's always going to work great for everybody. Yeah. In my research, I found that, uh, there are communities that, revolve around figuring out which personality types are, or yeah. not person personality tests are best to use. And there's a consensus that none of them except for one personality test is actually scientific based. And the, the one that they said it was called the big five, which I don't know anything about it. I re- looked at it briefly and I don't even remember the terms from it, but they said out of all of the personality tests, this is actually the only one that is based on scientific evidence. So that's an interesting point. You know, um, it's just it's just a reason for concern. So if, even if I weren't a Christian, as a secular person, I would say, eh, you know, this isn't this isn't that interesting interesting to me um, necessarily. So that's a point. And so there was a oh, this is just from Wikipedia. So you know, great sources. But um, they mentioned on there that in 2000, the United States Con- Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee uh, on Doctrine produced a draft report on the origins of the Enneagram to aid bishops in their evaluation of its use in their diocese. The report identified aspects of the intersection between the Enneagram and Roman Catholicism, which, in their opinion, warranted scrutiny with potential areas of concern, stating, while the Enneagram system shares little with traditional Catholic doctrine or spirituality— it also shares little with the methods and criteria of modern science. The br- burden of proof is on the proponents of the Enneagram to furnish scientific evidence for their claims. So naturally, I'm not a Roman Catholic, and you know it's not necessarily definitive to me whether or not the Enneagram, you know, is consistent with historical Catholic, you know, spiritual practice. But but the main thing that's interesting that they're saying is in their research, they didn't find it to be consistent with science either. So again, that just points back to the same point I was already making. Um, so you know that that that's my that's that's another concern about about the enneagram. It doesn't really have to seem seem to have great scientific backing. Um, and then my final point about concern about the enneagram is just it seems to shift the focus from scriptural, biblically derived wisdom to enneagram wisdom. You know, there are people, you know, outside of the Christian community who only use the enneagram for their personal development. They don't study the Bible. You know, they don't study Proverbs. They don't study the life of Jesus. They don't study Romans or Philippians or Colossians. They study the Enneagram. And they study people who write about the Enneagram, you know? And and a Christian can never let it get to that point in their lives. So um, one of the podcast episodes I sent to you was an interview between Ian Cron and Susan, uh, not uh, Beatrice Chestnut. And one of the things that shocked me when I, or struck me when I first listened to that episode is they are not starting with the Bible in any way. There's no prayer. There's no citation of Bible ver- a Bible verse at the beginning. There's no, you know, there's no basing their their thought in the Bible. It's bam, enneagram all day, all the time, every aspect of your life. Um, you know, it's all about the enneagram. The enneagram explains everything. And from a Christian perspective, the enneagram cannot 
explain everything. Not only that, but as a Christian, you I don't think you can say the Enneagram is necessary, right? You can't say, I need the Enneagram. Now that's, again, and, and we'll talk about this some more in a minute. That's not to say that the Enneagram isn't useful, but, you know, Scripture says, you know, the Bible says in 1 Timothy uh, 3.15, all Scripture has been given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is, mature, um, you know, he's able to grow up to be all he needs to be, um, for every and thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's not to say the Enneagram can't be useful, but you cannot say that people need the Enneagram in the strictest sense. Mm-hmm. Um, in some broad sense, it, it might be useful to people, but you can't say people need it. What people need is is Christ and the Scriptures and regeneration. And again, God uses means. So I, I want to talk about that a little more. But that, that's just that's just the point I wanted to make. That another concern I have with the Enneagram is it can be an all-consuming thing. And it, and it takes up how you view your parenting and how you view your interaction with everyone around you and how you view yourself. And and if the Enneagram... So earlier you mentioned, you know, some people just view it as a personality test. And frankly, I find that to be relatively not dangerous. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. You know, you you want to explain people to people why you you know, are so crazy detailed oriented and, and bothered by disorder. I'm a, I'm an Enneagram one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're, you're that person. Or, I, or like people have been on this for decades, like, oh, I'm a type A or I'm a yeah. type B or something. Uh, yeah, e- exactly. Exactly. So, you know, on that level, the Enneagram does not concern me. You know? I think what distinguishes the Enneagram though, from all of the other personality types tests that I've researched though, when I listened to one of the interviews with, I believe it was Nerano or Chazo or something like that. Uh, he brought up that the Enneagram, and I believe this was directly what he said, that is the pathway to God. And so you follow that path, you follow the personality type that you're supposed to be, and that is how you become more of what you're supposed to be and closer to God, which obviously that is opposite of, like that is not biblical source and stuff. So that that would be a concern if you take it too far. And I think think that leads me right into where, you know, what, what do we do about the Enneagram? And specifically, what do we do with the person who says, hey, I've benefited greatly from this? Um, I have someone very close to me in my life who is that person. You know, they feel like they've really benefited in in seeing some parts of themselves they really didn't understand before. Um, and what I would say is, you know, I don't I don't deny that at all. Um, I, I'm in no way denying that the enneagram may have been really really helpful, really life changing for for certain people. Um, and I'm not saying that they neglect those truths or turn their backs on them. And I'm not even really telling them strictly how to move forward with the Enneagram. Um, again, you know, I, I would say, you know, if you're, if you're faced with that argument, um, I think there are good logical responses to why that might be mm-hmm. and, and why that isn't definitive proof of the truth of the Enneagram. Uh, Marsha Montenegro, her background is, is in the new age. She was a new ager for a very long time. I mentioned her earlier in the podcast. She, um, She's founded Christian Answers for the New Age. She's a, a converted Christian and and uh, points out the errors of the New Age. Um, but in her background, she was an uh, astrologer, mm. not an astronomer. She didn't watch stars. She was an astrologer. So you know, she said, "Yeah, I did that because I'm a Leo or whatever." And you know, she had clients who she would do astrology typing for, and they were greatly benefited by that thing, mm. and or at least they would say they were. But that doesn't mean that the or that thing. That doesn't necessarily validate the thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I I hesitated even to give that example because I don't, I really, really don't want to say that. Look, you know, if if you do that enneagram test, you're gonna get possessed by a demon. You know, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. Well, in one of the podcasts that I listened to or another video, they almost somewhat directly said that if somebody uses the enneagram. Uh, to some extent, they would question their salvation. And I don't think that is at all what we're trying to say because we are saying that like you have to be aware of things, just like Christianity is very, it advocates for discernment. Yep. But also there is a bit, like you said, it does help some people because I think it is part of self-reflection and looking at why do I do the things I do? And if there's a tool that comes along and helps you understand yourself a little bit better, because obviously like the Bible does not contain every bit of all information out there. And there are some tools that God brings into your life, other people to bring into your life, even to show you a little bit more. Yep. And and I I would never deny the wisdom of sitting down with someone who's older and wiser and and has thought a lot about the way people work 
and trying to grow and trying to overcome struggles that you have. I, I would not deny that. Um, so, you know, and, and that means, and that, that's, that's a longhand way of saying, you know, go to a therapist, go to a psychologist, you know, again, you gotta be real discerning in these things, but, but go to a Christian therapist, uh, talk to them, uh, sit down with them and, 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 and have them help you work through these issues. Absolutely. I, I affirm those things. Um, but the Enneagram just makes me nervous. So, you know, kind of to summarize that, I, I would not say, I would not make a blanket statement. You must not ever use the Enneagram. I wouldn't say that. I would say personally that I can't feel comfortable recommending it to anyone hmm. um, because of its occultic background, because a lot of the teachers of the Enneagram are very liberal or they're new agers uh, or they learned everything they know about the Enneagram from new agers. Um, you know, those sources are, are, are pernicious. They hmm. sneak in and, and impact your thoughts in negative, your, 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 your worldview in negative ways. Now I don't, I don't want to be, and you and I might even disagree on this. You know, uh, <laughs> when we were younger, uh, a lot of people used to say, look, syncopated rhythm is from the devil, you know? And if you hear syncopated rhythm, it's just going to degrade your mind into mush and you're going to be, you know, sleeping with every girl you see because you listen to, to syncopated rhythms, you know? <laughs> it's like, okay, I, I don't want to be talking that way about the Enneagram. Like, Ooh, there's this vague new age thing that's going to sneak in and change your mind, you know, brainwashing. It's hard because there's a balance there because it really is hard to understand where the line is. When the any when where when does the new age come in and, and those terms can be hard to differentiate. Mm-hmm. How do you tell the difference between inspiration for a Muslim and inspiration for a Christian? You really have to dig into the terms and understand them. And so, you know, Again, that's why I can't recommend the Enneagram to anyone to use um, to better understand themselves because because I think there are real risks. Um, I think a lot on, on a popular level, it probably isn't very dangerous. But the deeper you go with the Enneagram, the more dangerous it gets because it's consuming more of your life, and you're going to be exposed to these more advanced teachers who have who have deep, um, you know, bad spiritual influences uh, that are going on. I think that's a really important point. Like you just mentioned a moment ago, that in recommending something. In Christianity, there is almost, nah, I don't want to say two types of people. There are a lot of people who are like run from all anything that could be perceived. Like you have the verses like abstain from all appearance of evil. True. And so you stay as far away from it as you can. But then there's the other side where it's like, look, you need to be discerning. You take, obviously you have the further side of it where you just like whatever, do anything. <laughs> but then like somewhere in the middle, I think there's a place to be like, look, there's some good and bad in lots yeah. of things because sin touches everything. Humans make things. So there's still sin in it. Even the best of your writing to help people still probably has flaws theologically or whatever it might be. So, yeah. And I think, you know, Paul's discussion of meat sacrificed idols is a great example. You know, he said, if you're going to call somebody to stumble, don't do it, but idols aren't anything, you know? And so th- what it comes down to is, is being discerning and careful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and again, if you do listen to Enneagram teachers, what I what I would say is, you know, look out. If they say something and it sounds a little off, do some research on, on the specific terms. You know, mm-hmm. understand the cosmic Christ and what what comes up with that. You know, in the in listening to the uh, interview between Ian Cron and Beatrice Chestnut, she talks about the three centers of the mind. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got, you've got the the lizard mind, which is emotional, and you've got the you know you've got the you know the subliminal mind, and the the concept of the three locations of the mind. That's that's a Scientology concept. Mm-hmm. Um, so when these people and, and it's just assumed, she, you know, she states it with great confidence, and she's a she's a psychiatrist of some kind. So like, it's easy to kind of assume that when these people say these things with confidence, they're coming from a place of understanding. But it may just be that they're coming from a place of New Ageism, you know, or or Scientology. Mm-hmm. So just you know, the, be aware of that kind of thing. Another thing, another thing is com- contemplative prayer. Mm-hmm. You know, again. If you're learning spiritual practices from Enneagram teachers, it needs to be based in the Bible. So, you know, be very careful if, and then if you know, you're, you kind of go down the rabbit trail and you're learning how to pray from Richard Rohr, that's very dangerous. You know, just because he's a good Enneagram teacher or he was, you know, in the bibliography of, of a, your favorite Enneagram book doesn't mean he's going to be teaching you true Christian spiritual principles. Um, you know, and then it comes to the question of do personality tests make sense? And I kind of already, I've already kind of already talked about that. I think, I think you should go to a therapist. Definitely. If you're struggling with things, you need to sit down and talk to somebody who's older and wiser and studies people. And it might not be your pastor. 
you know, I, I know this is this is controversial. You know, some people out there say, well, all your counseling should come from your pastor. Can you define like what you mean by therapist? Because like in the circles that I grew up in, the idea of like therapy or therapist was negatively viewed, not in like, oh, they need help, but more of like those people are weird. I think you mean it in a different light, like somebody older, wiser who can help you work through things. Or are you talking about like somebody who's trained in psychology? That's a great question. I think probably I don't have a well enough to find answer, honestly. Just somebody who can help from, you. From my experience, I don't think all, I think there are Christ, Christian counseling uh, organizations that are very helpful. And most of those are going to have to have had some kind of interface with some psychology, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the, you need to find one that you trust, be careful, be discerning, but don't let that stop you from getting help. That's the main thing that I'm saying, you know, and I don't think a lead, you know, a lot of churches, we, the, the people we know would be going to, there's one pastor and that guy got a degree from a theological institution, you know, maybe a very advanced degree, but he's an expert in exegeting the Bible, theology, maybe church history, maybe biblical languages. He might not be an expert in counseling. I don't think it has to be that guy that does it. Maybe there's another couple in your church or a, a counseling pastor in your church, or maybe there's a there's a Christian counseling organization that you can get a good recommendation from a, a solid Christian friend that you trust and go to a Christian counselor. I I, I I guess I would not, I definitely would not make a blanket recommendation to go to a psychiatrist mm -hmm. because I agree, you know, there's some weird ideas. Freud was a weird dude. Jung was a weird dude. You have to be real careful who you're talking to and who you're getting that advice from. But at the same time, I think, I think the stigma from our childhood, you know, growing up and oh, all psychology is bad. That can be dangerous. That can stop people from who are really struggling with depression. They're really struggling with, you know, a voice in their head that's constantly telling them they're not good enough. Mm -hmm. They're really struggling in some other area, you know, with, with addiction or whatever it is. And they're throwing out these resources, you know, just discounting them because, you know, because, oh, well, they're all bad. They're all unchristian. I just have to rely on my my local, you know, church church pastor of 100 people to, to do everything for me. I, I don't think that's I don't think that's necessary either. So if you want to take for if you're listening or watching and you have like I would somewhat of a negative connotation around the word therapy uh, or therapist, obviously psychologists is like that's even further yeah, down sure. the line. You might want to put in in that place instead like counselor counseling or even yeah. the word discipleship in the way that discipleship is. In Christianity right now, I think there's a lot of a mechanical discipleship or yeah. a programmatic discipleship, but I think it goes much further than that. It should be in a, in a holistic way, a, a deep and intimate relationship with somebody to help you grow in, in your understanding of God and like obviously like of yourself in relation to God. Yeah. So I think that could also be another a yeah. better term to yeah. use. Yeah, I mean, in, in an ideal world, every church would have, have somebody they send people to. Either they'd have somebody internally who they really trust, or they'd have ex somebody externally. And even then, you know, maybe the person that you go to, the, your church counseling pastor, like you just don't click with the guy or you feel like he's just, just judging you or not giving you good advice. Like I would just encourage people to look around and get help. Um, and I, and, and I, I would say professional help go to somebody who's trained in counseling, who has degrees. And then again, who you can get a, a recommendation from a Christian brother from who you trust. Um, yeah. so that, that's what I would say. And there are some really good resources out there. And I don't want to be like, uh, suddenly I'm like a focus on the family over there. But like I listen to them um, often and they and they provide many resources, a lot of them for free and stuff. And I understand that there is also a drawback. Like if your church does not provide those services, then it can be very difficult because in a lot of cases it is expensive. It costs money yep. to do that. Um, yep. But I know that there are a lot of other services out there. You can look in your area, contact folks on the family or um, your church pastor could probably help you find some place yeah. that does provide a, a good Christian counselor. I can personally highly recommend some of the families counseling. Um, you know, they have intensives for couples. I, I can recommend that stuff. It's good stuff. Um, so I definitely recommend um, getting professional help. Don't, don't feel like because you're a Christian, it has to be you and your buddy over coffee with a Bible and that's it. Or just you going to your local pastor. Um, you know, I think there's value outside of that too. Yeah. Exactly. So, well, I think that was a really good conversation. Hopefully it's helpful to you as listener or viewer. Obviously, Definitely. if you have part of the conversation that you'd like to add in, um, hopefully this will touch into some different uh, areas because I haven't had a, many comments on any of the videos or anything or a lot of feedback, especially going back as far as uh, my initial season two opener where I discussed with my friend about voting for Biden. I haven't really heard much. Well, I've heard feedback, but I haven't had anybody like comment on. But I think with this one, it would be good to have some dialogue going forward in this. And if it's especially even if it's been helpful for you and you don't have anything else to add, please um, let us know. And if you have more that you'd like, 
like to uh, express or um, you know follow through through some more information on this. I'm gonna put links in the description, yeah. some information there, and obviously anything you send, we'd try to answer and try to help you uh, understand more of like definitely the concerns in this area and and some of the information, the history there. Yep. I think. Yeah. So I mean, I think again specifically with background to um, on on new age issues, uh, Christian Answers for the New Age has a lot of good information. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also a pod- podcast that I've already mentioned called Cultish. Um, both of those are some good resources and places to start. There's a guy who who's gone been on college a number of times named Stephen Bankres, uh, and another one lady named Doreen Virtue. Uh, both ex New Agers, both um, solid Christians. So um, there are definitely resources out there, and we'll try to point people to them. Yeah, sounds good. Well, hey, uh, thanks Josiah for coming on the sure, show, man. and uh, of course I thank you for watching, listening, like, subscribe, comment if you're on YouTube, if you're on podcast apps, please subscribe there, leave me a good review, and uh, check out links to Patreon, or if you have other things, you can contact me on Facebook page i believe i have and twitter feed and i'll see you guys in the next episode